everybody, and welcome to ECTV Live. This is Judge Tom Munley with my co-host, David DeCosmo. And uh, I have to say this publicly, that I'm so proud to do this show with David. We have had, uh, David and I have been working together so many years, and it's just wonderful to have David here with me. He Thanks, has more Judge. experience in television than anybody I ever met. Wow. But what's nice about this show, David, we have another man who's involved in television, and that's our host, our, our guest today, Rusty Fender, who is Rusty? on TV every single day now. And I watch Rusty. He's always on television. Rusty happens to be my friend for 30 years, just like you've been, David. <laughs> and uh, he was nice enough and gracious enough to come here and do this show with us. And I, I knew he was a busy man. Glad to have him. And, and we're so glad to have him. And uh, Rusty, welcome to our show. Tom, David, a pleasure being here. Thanks for the invitation. Did you have any trouble getting here? Were you able to get no. through the... <laughs> Let's not go with the traffic angle. Traffic was a light day today, so it was a, it was a good day for traveling, even in the area. You know what's amazing? I have to say this, and uh, I haven't been on TV as long as you, David, and uh, Rusty has been on TV probably more than I, I've been, but people, I remember people used to, I was talking one day in a, in a, in a, in a um, natural food store, and somebody said, I can't see you, but you're attorney Tom Munley, just by my voice. Oh, sure. And I'm sure yeah. you get it all the time in Rusty. All the I'm time. I'm sure you get all it the all time. the time. It's amazing. And I'm, I'm pretty audio-oriented being an engineer by mm -hmm. trade, but <laughs> I, I don't think I could discern another voice in a crowd uh, right, without right. seeing the face. I, I know. It, it's amazing. Some people have the perception for audio and some for visually, yeah. but it, it's truly amazing. It is amazing, isn't it? Yes, and I, I will, I'll call somebody on the telephone, and they'll recognize the voice, which surprises me. Right. Uh, and yet, and from a television setting, remember that I was a reporter, not an anchor. So people will see me without hearing me, and they'll say, I know you, but they won't necessarily come up with the name. When I speak, they're more apt to recognize me via the voice than necessarily from sight. Right. And that happens to me all the time because I, on, on the legal show that I did, but. And Rusty, I want to ask you a question because, uh, as I said, you're, you're getting you're on TV a lot now. You're doing weather, you're doing traffic. Are you doing anything else other than weather and traffic? Well, right I now? do our own stations. Uh, a matter of fact, we have uh, five stations in the building: uh, WYLK included, uh, the Mountain, uh, Froggy 101, KRZ, and so on. Plus WBRE in the morning from five until uh, seven o'clock on their Eyewitness News morning show, and then the afternoon show at five o'clock uh, with uh, Candace and Drew. And then in the daytime, I also teach at Wilkes University. I'm there for the last uh, seven years, and before that at uh, another university in the area as well for seven years. So I teach in uh, a different uh, a variation of uh, mathematics and uh, aerospace engineering and some broadcasting courses as well. So my day runs about 3 o'clock in the morning till about 7 o'clock at night. That's amazing. And the weekends as well. Wow. So it's a seven-day weekend. And week I deal. know just from the traffic point of view, you're actually you're actually running back and forth from one studio to the other. And that is the most common question, David. You're absolutely right. Is like, how many of these are taped? Well, I do have to tape one station. KRZ is taped about five or ten minutes in advance. Uh, traffic is not really going to change that much in five or ten minutes. But because all stations try and more or less even our competition run their commercial breaks at the same time, it would be impossible to be on all the time because commercial breaks, of course, you want everybody running commercials at the same time. You want everybody playing music at the same time. So if you're in a commercial break and you switch, well, you're not going to get anything because all the other stations are also in commercial breaks. So because they all hit at the same time, we take KRZ, but you're right. I run from studio to studio, and every three minutes for those three or four hours in the morning, I am on some different variation of right. radio or television. So, And again, it's the people who run the board, the people who in the control room. They can either add a song or drop a song, but they can make or break me being late, early, or right on time. Sure. But you're right. Sure. And David, you know what? When I asked when when I asked, I asked Rusty if he could do this show, I know how busy he is. I mean, I know. I mean, he's still he's doing on a daily basis what you and I used to do on a daily basis. I never did quite that much. We <laughs> never we never did that much, David. You're right. We never did that much. But still, our time, uh, our live shows took up all our all our, yeah. all our time, as you know that. But Rusty, he doesn't stop. He doesn't stop. And now, Rusty, I just have to say this. I heard with the BP oil spill that you had, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to say something out of turn, but didn't you have some idea on how to stop this oil spill? I was one of five people contacted at the time, about 30, 30 days ago. There were 80,000 emails, 80,000 suggestions, and 40,000 phone messages. Now it's over a quarter of a million. I was one of five people contacted the entire world 
with my idea, which I submitted. And I actually had the idea of being an aerospace systems engineer all my life. I worked at CBS in New York for eight years, and then at NBC at Rockefeller Center for eight years, and at AT&T Satellite Systems at the World Trade Center for four years, and four years at MSNBC in Secaucus, and so on and so forth. When something like this happens of a national or even a global crisis, you immediately begin to think of what you can do to, ha to help this, to, to stop this. And a couple days after this, this catastrophe happened, and this is going back well, about 80 days or so, right. but I had an idea on something just off the, the tip of my head. And I figured you know, this would be actually about maybe four or five days, and this would be contained. I never thought I would dream that it would be over two months in the making. So I didn't do anything about it because I figured that my idea would probably be covered by some of the other minds as well that have been working on this problem. I mean, you know, if you're an engineer, you can fix something under the ocean or in space or on land for the most part. Engineering is engineering. And it was about 30 days later, this was still going on, and I'm watching this documentary on the Discovery Channel, and Barbara turns to me and says, he says, you know, we're watching the video of this 90-year-old this man in a rowboat in 90% humidity, 95 degrees off the shore, trying to scoop up these tar balls in a net. And she turns to me and she says, this is pathetic. I said, don't you think you could do something about this? And I said, what, ex what, ex <laughs> what exactly would you like me to do about this? Yeah. I said, well, you know, you're, you're an aerospace systems engineer. It's not, you know, really a, a common career move. Didn't you have an idea? I said, well, I had an idea about 30 days ago. I think, I think in the 80,000 uh, emails and the 40,000 phone calls, I think that perhaps with the odds, somebody else has maybe covered my idea in that. I said, well, you know, you should try and contact them. I said, you know what? Tomorrow, this was on a Sunday, tomorrow when I get back to work on a Monday, I said, I will look on their website and see if there's any way to contact them. And I did, and there was an email that says, any engineering or technical personnel, can you help us? So I called this number. It was in the Houston, Texas area. I uh, received a blank email draft where you had to put into four different paragraphs your idea, your materials, your expertise, who you are, and how this thing could be solved. Now, each one was 50 words or less. Uh, it kind of takes me 50 words or less to say hello to somebody. So it's kind of <laughs> tough to put an idea, which for the most part would take about 72 hours to implement my practice I into this job, into a brief description. But I did that. I sent it back to them on Monday. And 48 hours later on a Wednesday, I had a conference call from the Houston Engineering Department of BP. And they wanted me to submit more diagrams, handwritten, AutoCAD, which is an engineering program, or what have you, to a different engineering firm and was on four or five different conference calls after that with those folks in so the Gulf. So it was being considered. It was definitely yeah. being considered. In fact, they called me three or four different times to update uh, many of the different logistics and the mathematical logistical information components that they had. You know, it, it's really tough when you haven't seen something like this, to just to go from the same video that, that you, Dave, or you, Tom, have seen on TV. You know, this is kind of like trying to fix the Mars rover on Mars. You know, you're a million miles away from this thing. You're, you're 5,280 feet into the sea. So you're one mile down and an additional 1,500 feet below crush depth. So intervention by a human is totally out of the question here. You're using two robotic air pressurized pneumatic robots, which for the most part have very, very limited type of movement. Uh, you, you can't, you can grip, but not like a human. You don't have fingers, you don't have, it's tethered. It's very difficult to try and fix this. I mean, you know, where this is located, pitch black, 24 hours a day, 38 degrees, bitter cold, no lighting except for the light provided by it. it, it this, this may as well be on Venus where this location is. So and to you, try you've it, got tidal uh, concerns too, I'm sure, or pre pressure in and the movement of the water. Exactly. I mean, you know, what can you do for this? Plus, the, the pressure coming out of this, which I found out later was 21 inches because they don't tell you this until you get involved with them. So 21 inch diameter pipe, which is not really that big, 21 inches. And it was cut by one of the robotic arms, carbide steel. And, you know, there's 2,000 pounds per square inch coming out of this. Now, 2,000 pounds per square inch at 10 feet, if you held your hand in front of it, would take your arm off at the wrist. At wow. 2,000, exactly. Ten. Plus, it's wow. a combination of natural oil, which is light, sweet, crude. It's methane gas, and it's also natural gas, which is a byproduct of the actual gas drilling operation. So it, you do have a lot of different components here which you have to take. It's not just that easy as a cork in a bottle. It's a very sophisticated cork in a very sophisticated bottle that you have to deal with. And at the time, when we were talking back and forth, you know, you had to find out uh, pounds per square inch and different mathematical equations. I mean, there are different things that, that components that come into play, but only if you're in with them. 
This is not released to the public. So I made some alterations on my uh, mathematical figures and all that. Had a couple of local, uh, as soon as this hit the airwaves, uh, radio, TV, and newspaper, I was just inundated by at least 10 different engineering firms, including Acker Drilling on Shady Lane Road in Clark Summit. And Mike from up there said, we could build to your spec exactly what you want. It wouldn't even cost $4,500. Tell you what, we'll build it for nothing. He said, if you build it for nothing, I'll fly down there for nothing and help these engineers and technicians install this thing on my own time. Now, of course, in the long run, there would probably be some type of compensation for this, but I wanted sure. nothing from this. This was, a, this was the, one of the greatest public human interest fixes possibly ever. It, it's, it's a crisis of, of, of exponential oh, proportions. Sure. Sure. So we wanted nothing from this. And again, this was all considered. Uh, what I had in mind was basically a, uh, you know, the, the, the problem was is that I waited 30 days to submit my problem. But the good thing was I waited 30 days to submit my problem, the, the, the actual component for this. Meaning, out of those first 80,000 messages that were coming in, they were coming in at 25,000 a week for the first week. So by waiting the 30 days, it limited all the screwballs and crackpots out there who were saying everything from flushing radial tires down in this yeah. thing. That, so it weeded out the people who got in at the beginning of the curve on this. And near the end, when it was down to 25 suggestions a week, that's when my idea came in. So perhaps, again, life is 99% being in the right place at the right, right time, time, as we both know. And perhaps it was that waiting that made them look at this a little deeper, a little longer, a little further, and say, you know, this is really interesting. And I had a cork in a bottle, a highly sophisticated cork in a bottle, because it's not, it's not going to be submerged welding. It's not going to be MIG or TIG welding, the submerged plastics welding. It's not going to be any type of multi-million dollar fix that MIT and Harvard engineering was coming up. It's not going to be that. It's, it's not going to be that, that, that elaborate. What I basically thought of was a carbide steel bullet. The bullet was half hollow and lined with two to three ply vinyl sheeting. So it would be streamlined at the beginning. It would fit into the 21 inch uh, diameter pipe, which is also made of carbide steel, three quarter inch, meaning of that pipe, you could possibly crimp. That was my whole wow. idea. I would dimple the pipe. And again, you had to find out if this was capable of the robots being able to do this. Dimple the pipe every two inches around the entire circumference of the pipe, the opening. Dimple it, make an indentation. So therefore, you set up an internal ring, an internal plateau, two feet down, which would be the most strength of that area before the coupling. Again, right. you had to get photos of this. There's a coupling or a breech plate, it's about two feet down. So about 18 inches down to dimple a ring from the outside to crease this pipe, creating an internal plateau. When more or less this bullet-shaped wall anchor went in, it would go in because the soft flexible sheets of three-ply vinyl, PVC, would be overlapped again, because don't forget, you have all this force coming out. So you want it to go with the force. You want to streamline this going in. The only thing was is that when they were cutting around the carbide steel of the pipe, the pipe was no longer a perfect circle. It was damaged a bit. It is now oval-shaped. It is egg-shaped. It is elliptical. So there's a slight eccentricity in the pipe of about one degree. Again. I designed the three ply of the vinyl to encount that eccentricity because the vinyl would give, it would bend, it would fill in the void or the hill or the valley, the eccentricity of the pipe itself. Well, how does this thing stay in? Because nothing ever stays in. Well, that's the rim, the internal plateau of indentations. So basically, what I designed was a basic wall anchor. So. This was this is a, a basic a basic look, but there would be four pneumatic loaded, not spring loaded, but pneumatic loaded feet. Two here, northeast, south and west, two on the side. It would go in with the bullet, and when it came back out, it would grab right. onto that plateau. Right. Well, when these guys in Houston at engineering on the phone, you know, on a conference call with MIT in Massachusetts, when they saw this, they said, that is absolutely Unbelievable. Can we get this man on the phone? And again, it, it, it depends again, it, it depends on who you are. When the first thing they asked me when I called in 
to the area code, to their phone number, their phone support. They said, you know, who are you? What do you do? So I said, well, you know, I'm a university professor. I, you know, I've, I've worked at the aerospace systems engineering for, for CBS, for NBC, for at and said, hold on a second, we'll get somebody to talk to you. I'm sure, and this is with no disrespect, I'm sure if I sold shoes in a shoe store, I don't think they would have gotten one of the lead uh, engineers to talk yes. to you. So it depends on what you're doing at the time. And again, it's all about being in the right place at the right time. But this was very, very simplistic. But the complication, the rub, the coup d'etat, was the small plateau inside, which would grab this and prohibit this oh. from coming back up. Would it be airtight? Pretty close, about 98%. But stay, phase two would be, being that you cannot go over, because there's 2,000 pounds per square inch of material Impressive. coming up. You can't go over it, but you can go around it. So a hinged cap around it, welded, and all preformed with the exact specifications, which is three inch, with a siphon pump and a siphon hose one mile up to the ship, not only to siphon out the excess oil oozing from around the vinyl sheet of this, but that way you could also prevent any leakage to the point of 99.99% air and water tight at that point. Now listen and they everybody, loved you're, it. you're hearing this from a man you know as Rusty Fender who a lot of you think of for giving traffic reports, and he does it so very, very well on many, many stations in the area. So now we go behind all this. Rusty Fender is a radio name. <laughs> who is Rusty Fender? Well, my name is Dale Michalajic, and uh, actually I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in aerospace systems engineering from Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. So I've always been in the aerospace business, uh, managed the space program, as I said, for CBS, uh, for uh, NBC, and for AT&T, and was in charge of actually the fleet of 23 domestic geosynchronous satellites in orbit, oh. <laughs> including the uh, jet arc thrusters, the apogee and perigee kick motors, and managed the hydrazine fuel on board for about the last 25 and years. Why, the and why does someone with that kind of ability wind up in radio? Well, you know, <laughs> I've always done radio, and I still do it as Shadow Steel on KRZ on a Saturday night for my 25th year. That's, that's what I was going to say. Uh, Rusty it's, Fender is also Shadow Steel. And, was well, also, and Dale is, too. That, yeah, that's and, correct. And, and a lot of people don't know uh, that he's Shadow that Steel. That is correct. And that came first, and this was a part-time deal. I would come in every single weekend, although I had a place in New Jersey, several places in New Jersey over the last 25 years. I was going to do this show on Saturday night, which is now carried on Sirius Satellite and Westwood One, 150 stations. My 25th year, and as you well know in broadcasting, 25 years in this business is like 25 lifetimes. So That's if it right. ended tomorrow, it would be, uh, it would have to end. But I had a great run. But, and other names it's as well as... End. It's not going to end, Russ. I can tell you right well, now. Well, you know, and other names like James West on our 80 station, The Buzz, back in the 90s. So I've been a, a compilation of names, always in broadcasting, try to be at least three different people. So if you get fired, you're still working under two of those <laughs> other names. That's another tip. But that's what I did, and this was more or less, you know, my retirement job back in 1990. There was no traffic in this area. This was one of the few markets, and back then this was a top 50 market. We're market number 69 right. now because the population, as you well know, gets older, and you know people die off and people do move out. David, we remember when it was top. In the, we were that's in the right. It was 48. Yeah. It was 48 back in, yeah. the, and it was higher than that back All in the 60s. All big markets have traffic. That's before, exactly so. right. This was one of the few markets top 50 not. that had no traffic, and people always left and so. That's because there's no traffic in this area. Well, you know what? Back in 1990, when I started this, four cars at a red light designated a traffic report. Now you really have traffic now. And if there's not, by golly, three days to go by without some type of a tractor trailer crash or some hazardous material spill, I mean, this is, we have really seen traffic in this area grow exponentially in the past 20 years oh, that I've been doing traffic. I, I can't tell you how many times that you've saved me a lot of time. Well, I'm glad you said uh, that. I get that from a lot of people, David. And again, traffic is real in this area. When we started out, though, it was more or less a sales tool. Traffic is a sales tool. It's designed to sell commercials. You know, mm -hmm. I do a live read for 10 seconds. So it, it's, it's a live commercial. Now it's really a service. But they recruited me because I knew the area. I worked out of town. They said, would you be interested in, uh, you know, in coming back and starting a traffic service? We had a helicopter for four years. We flew in a Cessna uh, uh, high-wing plane for four years out of a tech aviation, which was uh, formerly the Millionaire Club up at the Wilsbury Scranton Airport. And I said, well, they said, you know, you know, you probably pay more in income tax than we could pay you to do this job. But uh, so <laughs> after 20 years, 21 years out there, I came back and I did this. And with all the other jobs, you know what? I'm making just about the same money with the teaching at the Wilkes University, bless them. I'm making just about the same money I did with half the expenses. So, right. I mean, things do come out in the wash every once in a while. And you're home right. also. And I'm home also. <laughs> and also, you mentioned Barbara before. Obviously, one of my close friends, as you know. And uh, uh, she's a very close friend of Rusty. And uh, 
uh, I do want to say hello to her. But you know, one thing I wanted to ask, Rusty, since all of us have been in TV for many, many years, uh, I, David and I aren't in TV like we used to be. I miss it, and I know you miss it, David. Sometimes. Because we did it, we did it every night. Not when it's snowing. Right, we did it every <laughs> night, every single night we were together. Rusty, and when you weren't in television, didn't you miss it? Yes, I, I did. I, I, I like radio. I mean, I go way back with David because yeah. David probably won't remember this, but I met him must be 30 years ago when he was the news director at a station named WMJW right. at the top of Plymouth Mountain. And uh, you were in charge of that operation for a very long time. That was yeah. like uh, one of the big hit stations back then. So you did radio a long time before you did TV as right. well, sir. Oh, oh, a long, yeah, I, I actually started in 1959 as an errand boy at a radio station. So it's been a lot of years uh, along. But, but, but Dale uh, uh, Shadow, Rusty, uh, <laughs> if I can talk about And more. To, oh, and more. <laughs> Uh, when it comes to that traffic, which again is, is how you're primarily known right now, how do you get it? What, what do you do to get your information? Second most common question. PennDOT anymore in the age of email, they will email me a week in advance right down to the minute and the hour and the direction where they'll be working next week on any of the interstates, any of the state routes or the U.S. highways. And then, and, and this is maybe not good to say, but we have the public, the listening public on all, all of our stations so well trained that unfortunately because we put out what I named the jam line 10 years ago for a traffic jam line. We have an incoming line where you could call for your charge to the station, any cell service. We put out that number on every single traffic update. I do about 60 a day, 60 one minute traffic updates on TV and radio. We have the public so trained that they will actually call us. They will call the radio station before they will call 911 to report an accident. Is that a good practice? Not particularly, but we have no control. That's the power of the medium on something like that. You give the number and they will call us to alert the other people either behind or alongside them of an ensuing problem that either just happened. They'll be driving over the debris on the road from an accident, but they will call the radio station first and call 911 secondary. We don't really endorse doing that. It's always good to get help first, but we get it before anybody gets it. We get the information on some of these crashes before the actual 911 comm center gets now, here's it. Now, it's, it's time for confessions because I call the jam line <laughs> whenever I've seen a, a type of any sort. And I mean, it, it, you share that information, so you're helping an awful lot of people. And as a listener, David, after you call, don't you almost hear it instantaneously yes, on the yes. next report on a station you're listening to? I've, I've had no time to wait on it. As a matter of fact, there are times when in between your regularly scheduled traffic reports, the newscaster will take it and he will use it as part of his newscast. Absolutely. And this is information that really should be shared with everyone because, as you say, and, and with all the work that's going on now, our, our interstate system, I remember covering former Governor Scranton at the, uh, at the groundbreaking for the intersection of, and listen, talk about going back, the Anthracite Expressway and the Keystone Shortway. Sure. In case you don't know, that's the Keystone Shortway 81. is I-80 and Eight. the Anthracite Expressway is I-81. That is and exactly down right. Down in Drums is that's the correct. intersection. I covered the, the governor when he did the groundbreaking there. So that's how old those highways are. And we're at a stage now, I guess, Rusty, especially with bridges, where we're very concerned and things Mostly every bridge from the two interstates you named were all built in 64. 64 was the day when 56 was the five-star, being that Eisenhower, Dwight Eisenhower was the five-star general. The five-star interstate system was actually put into, into practice in 56. By the time they secured the land, the contracts, the, the uh, eminent domain, 64 was when most of it became available. And then in 68 to 72, I mean, 72 to 75, the last link of I-84 was not yet built until 75. As you remember, the Elmhurst bridges were not built until 1975. So this is still an ongoing process. You always say 75, well, that's 30 years ago. Yes, it was. But I mean, from 64 to 75 was a long time. So in that area, in that era, we're talking 50 years already, 50 years. And the traffic has just grown again exponentially from 1964. And, and especially the, commercial traffic, the heavy, heavy trucks. Especially uh, some nights you wouldn't get a tractor trailer on the highway. Now probably 80% of all the, right. the, the, the travel on the highway is all tractor trailer, heavy truck, oversized, low oh, traffic. That's right. So yeah. that's what, it, and that what's really knock, knocks the heck out of a lot of the infrastructure is, is the heavier than usual traffic. And again, we've heard this a million times, but it's true. These roadways were not designed 
for the, 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 the quantity and the quality of the traffic that flows on these systems. So I think the workmanship that was done back in 1964 has done a great deal in holding up. That's yeah, actually, when they were built, you had a lot more public transportation was being used. They, were they not actually uh, for military purposes in one sense? That exactly was. The interstate system was designed mainly to move military personnel and equipment without traffic lights, without stop signs, and without railroad tracks. It was made to make a free move based on the German Autobahn. That's correct. Do you see more public transportation coming back in the years ahead? I don't. I think the love with the American automobile is here forever. Uh, look at someone's driveway now. I mean, back then there was so little car traffic. Back in 1965 and 66, when they opened 81, a portion of it, any of my, going with my father in his Chevrolet Caprice Classic. 1966, they opened an, era, an area from the uh, Wilkes-Barre Scranton Airport, which was Route 315, or called the Avoca Bypass at that point, up as far as River Street. You could lay down in the middle of that highway at 5 <laughs> o'clock in the afternoon for 10 minutes and not see a car. I don't think you could do that now at 2 o'clock in the morning on a Christmas Eve. Right, right. <laughs> Well, so Dave, I think the love is here forever. Yeah, yeah. David, I, uh, Rusty, uh, and I, as I said, I've known him 30 years. He mesmerizes me. I could listen to him all day long. Uh, and we're, we're, I just got to notice that we're, out of, we're running out of time. But uh, well, This has been a real treat. Oh, a real, real treat. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, I am so happy he appeared here. He, he told me several months ago that when I asked him that he'd be on our show. And it's so nice to have Rusty here. But David, uh, it was a great show, I have to admit. And I wish we had an, an hour at least with Rusty. Well, you might be able to get him back again. Yeah, I, I think he'll come back. He'll do our show. And I feel honored. I'm sitting or here. Or we can bring Shadow Steele yeah, back. Yeah, well, I, maybe we'll have Shadow Steele. But I'm sitting between, I'm, I'm in the middle of two of the most known people in television, David the Cosmo and Rusty Fender. So on behalf of my co-host, David the Cosmo, and my great friend, Rusty Fender, I want to thank you so much for watching ECTV Live, and we'll see you again next week. That was a